So it's Saturday night, March 21st. You're seeing this later. My videos get uploaded and uh, usually go out about 1 in the morning on Tuesday. So lots things have been happening in the news and things have been changing very quickly. But as I was putting next Tuesday's video together, it occurred to me that I should talk to you about something else and obviously the whole world is under this threat of uh, or under a current situation of the global pandemic. This is something that seamen aren't immune to. Before I uh, get into that, I'd like to take a minute for you guys to think about just how valuable shipping is. It's obviously the career that I love and a path that's been good to me, but it's also good to everyone whether you're American or wherever you are in the world. Shipping is responsible for a whole lot of goods, whether you know it or not. Um, around here in these areas, a lot of the heat that you get for your house, electricity you get, the gas you have in your car, the diesel that runs the trucks that deliver the stuff on the roads, you know, and then all the other goods that come. All has to do with shipping. It's not just the cruise ship industry. Okay, having said that, I figured I would address before... I have a video that's coming up, and you're going to have that after I get done with my little rant here. But, uh... And that's going to be on, uh... Flimsel marks and load lines and draft marks. So, stay tuned for that. But I just wanted to tell you, uh... We have been affected, it seems, for weeks now even before the media was really involved with this, the Coast Guard has been very active giving us bulletins about uh, what we should do when we encounter foreign ships and that sort of thing. Our home office continues to daily give us updates of what's going on and how we should proceed and different company protocols that we should observe. I don't know that I'm supposed to get into that with you guys or not and it doesn't really matter because every single day they change to become more and more stringent so uh, basically a lot of us don't have a lot of contact with the people on foreign vessels but some of our tankermen have to deal with the chief engineers and the people when they're fueling uh, other ships and, uh, it's kind of scary. That was that was a, that was what we were worried about before. What's interesting for me is that this is supposed to be my time off, and I'm working over, meaning working extra on my time off, and uh, I'm on a different boat, and I'm not on on the boat. That I'm in I'm in Baltimore right now, and uh, on Wednesday, I'll be going to my boat. Hopefully, if things don't change, to meet up with my crew in New York. What's kind of scary about that is that I've been relatively safe and secure on this boat with the same crew and the same people. We haven't really had contact with the outside world. And uh, my crew is very dear to me. They're kind of my family. But they live in all different parts of the country. Some of them have young kids that are probably in daycare and all that sort of thing. And have They've been at home and been in contact with everyone else. We don't know how things are going to go. And then I have to get from Baltimore to New York. And At the time of recording this, I think New York has something like 10,000 cases of the coronavirus already. And by the time this video airs, it will probably, unfortunately, be a lot more than that. I feel very confident that uh, in the event that most of us on here in this line of work, if we get the coronavirus, hopefully we won't suffer the worst effects of it, but it is something to consider. I think that something that I really worry about is I worry about my dad. He's all alone, and if I were home, I couldn't go visit him anyway. I don't know that that would be the right thing to do. He, he lives far away from me, but I, I don't mean that I couldn't visit him for his distance, but I don't know that having contact with people from other parts of the country is the best thing for people of his age. So it's kind of scary when you uh, talk about other people and other things. Remember that uh, I, I know that most of the country and most of the world for that matter is in a self-quarantine mode. 
And we've been laughing and joking, saying that, oh, 14 days of quarantine, that's just a regular hitch for us. Unfortunately, it's a lot more than that for a lot of people and for us too. And what do you do? You know, uh, there's a lot of questions that are unanswered. We're all healthy right now. When I go to my boat, hopefully nobody's coming that doesn't feel healthy. But things change. They say you could have this for two weeks. Well, you guys all know the deal. Anyway, it's a scary time. Um, it does affect shipping. And believe me, I mean, the, the, the real front line, as everyone knows, are the first responders and the people working in the hospitals and the people working in laboratories trying to fix this. But shipping's a big deal. You don't want to lose the people delivering everything to you. So, uh, that's something that I keep in mind. Anyway, I'm going to try to get this video uploaded, and if you're seeing this, it will probably be after Tuesday. And when I get to New York on Wednesday, I'll try to do a quick little video and if things have changed. I know right now uh, my relief has told me to tell my guys coming on that maybe we should do some shopping because the shopping isn't as great in New York when we go there only because uh, I guess there's a, they went to get bottled water and there wasn't a lot of bottled water. There wasn't a lot of paper products and that sort of thing. Not to mention I don't know that I'm real comfortable sending my crew to go buy $1,500 worth of food for the boat for two weeks. You know, the longer they're buying all that stuff, the more they have a chance to opportunity to get exposed. I want us to all get on our boat and safely lock down and do our work and not really have contact until the things start to settle down. But uh, anyway, so I'll try to get up another quick little video for you. If you guys are watching this, it's like I say, it'll probably be after Tuesday, so Wednesday, hopefully crew change will go. Oh, that brings up another story. Um, there's apparently another company that I've heard, and I've only heard this via what we call Doc Talk, so I don't know if it's real or not. But apparently other companies are telling the oncoming crews not to come on, and they want the crews that are on the boat to stay on for who knows how long, because they don't want people to change, because they don't want the interruption of... Uh, workers so it's an interesting time anyway I just figured I put that on here hope you like the video about the interesting hierog hieroglyphics on the sides of ships anyway thank you guys Okay, so we're taking a little field trip today to check out the funny marks on the side of a ship. So, we have two different marks here. We have the AB load line and the plimsoll mark. So the AB load line, I believe it's done through the American Bureau of Shipping, and this basically does the same principle as this. What happens is if, if this boat is loaded too much, it'll go the, if this line is underwater, that means that it's loaded too much. Okay, so this is the plimsoll mark, and the way I understand it, I should have looked this up to make sure that I didn't get this wrong, but uh, it's always fun for you guys to correct me in the comments. So if I get this wrong, feel free to comment. I believe that plimsoll was an Englishman who worked for the insurance companies. So going back in the days of sailing ships. Sailing ships only got paid, or you know, the cargo ships got paid by how much cargo they, they, they moved. So if you loaded a boat safely, you might make it to your destination, but you might not be rich. If you overloaded the boat, if you made it to your destination, you would make more money. So insurance companies started losing a lot by riskier captains taking risks. And because every boat is different, we don't know what happens, you know, we know how the boat should handle when it's out of water, when it's designed. There's different characteristics in the, you know, a marine architect uh, can tell you how, how much the boat is going to float and how much it can hold and all that sort of stuff. Well, anyway, Plimsoll came up with this mark so that any insurance man can walk down to a dock, look at any ship or any barge, and find out whether it's overloaded. The problem with that is that 
or at least the way the story that I hear, like I say, I, I might have the story wrong, but Plimsoll worked somewhere in England and it was up in a river. So ships would come up and load in fresh water. Now fresh water is not as dense as salt water is. So because of that, boats would sink lower down in fresh water. So they needed to have different marks. So, and then we also had a problem where they could, they could take on more cargo in the winter than they could in the summer because traditionally there were worse conditions that the boats had to deal with in the winter. So this first line right here is T, and that's for if you're in tropical waters. The second one is S for salt, that's for salt water. The next one is W for winter, and then WNA is for winter North Atlantic. So in other words, if you're going to be in the winter in the North Atlantic, you don't want to have the water over that line. Now over here, this, these two lines over here, TF is for top, tropical fresh and top tropical and, and then just, just fresh water. So because of the difference in water density, the same, I mean, I'm sure that 90% of you guys are going to get this right off, you already know it. But if you had, oh, I don't know, if you had a ball that floats in salt water and you put a line around where the water level was of a ball floating on the water, it's not going to float the same way. It's going to actually be a little lower in fresh water. Now this right here will demonstrate exactly the difference on this particular boat. And it changes depending on how the boat is all designed. And so the Plimsoll Mart it isn't something they just stick up there. It's done poor, uh, for the parameters of the vessel and it's moved up and down where it's supposed to be and welded to the hull. So right here, if you load it in fresh water right here, and the water came right up to this line, as you went out to sea, the boat would, st and the salinity of the water started to increase as you were heading out to sea, the boat would actually start lifting out of the water. And then it would get to here on regular, in regular salt water. And so what happens is the boat isn't getting any lighter. It weighs exactly the amount, the same amount. The problem is that the water that it's displacing is becoming heavier, which pushes the boat higher out of the water. So, uh, so that's, that's a Plimsoll mark, AB load line, and that's what it is when you see those funny hieroglyphics on the side of a ship. Okay, so the next funny thing that we're going to talk about are draft marks. And draft marks basically tell you the trim of the boat. They'll have draft marks in the bow and draft marks in the stern. And they're not just random. They don't just tell you what they do. Let me show you some right here. You see this boat right here? If you notice, there's something special about these. And it's not just these. It's every boat, in, at least in the U.S. that I know of. I know foreign boats usually do it with the metric system. But we're still in the imperial system here. And what happens is the way you read draft marks is not a random thing. So in other words, you see it says 11 there. It says 12, 13, and 14. The 11 is kind of covered up. This boat's been tied up for a while. So there, it's hard to read that. But that's right at the water line. Hopefully you can see that. And uh, actually, let me see if I can might have a better shot of this over here with the sun on it. Oh yeah, this is going to work better here. Okay, so you can see that a little bit better. Now, the thing that makes draft mark special is that the numbers themselves are exactly six inches high, and there's six inches of space in between the numbers. So if you don't have to just say something is like at 11 feet. If, I don't know if you can, like I say, it's dark down there, but the 11, you don't have to say that's right at 11 feet. You can figure it's halfway up the 11, and if the 11 is six inches six inches tall, then it would be 11 foot three inches. So if it went to the top of the 11, it would be 11 foot six inches, and if it went in between the 11 and the 12, it would be 11 foot nine. And so that's how you read draft marks. And uh, what's good, they don't just use it just for the trim. When you load barges, sometimes they load them, not, not with uh, the, bar the fuel barges, we do it a different way here, but when you load like a hopper barge, or even a, something with dredging spoils or anything like that, you adjust the, the list of the barge by looking at the draft marks on one side and then looking at the draft marks on the other side and you know whether you have to load on one side or not. Let me see if I can get a better shot of another boat with brighter draft marks. Okay, so this right here is a boat that I'm working on right now and if you notice it says 13. So even though we can't see the number all the way underneath the water and if the water was like r even worse than it is as far as clarity goes, you can guess that the next number underneath 13 is going to be 12. And so since we're not quite seeing half of the 12, maybe an inch up from half, 
So maybe we'd say that's 12 foot 4 inches. If it went to the top of the 12, once again it would be 12 foot 6 inches. And when you read it, like if it was, if it drew 13 feet, the water would come just to the bottom of the 1 and the bottom of the 3. If it was right there, then it would be 13 feet. And then like I say, if it's at the top, it would be 13 6. And so that is how draft marks work.